Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's lovely to welcome everyone to church today. It's almost sunny five. It's windy five um, today. Um, normally it is very sunny five. Today is just a windy, windy day. But it's lovely to have everybody in church again this morning. I think the kids are still coming downstairs maybe as we're, as we're coming in. So um, welcome to everybody who's been able to join us from great distances um, here in the church this morning. It's lovely to have you with us uh, to worship together. Um, happy Sabbath to anybody who's joining us online as well. Um, as we, um, we're online, we're going to hand over our, our praise team. We're going to uh, lead us in three songs this morning. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Psalm chapter six, 100. <laughs> what is what is Psalm in my Bible? I have a bad headache. <laughs> but just now, because I'm speaking, my headache like is leaving me, you know? Because there is no place for two things, like the Lord and headache at the same time doesn't worship and headache doesn't combine so um psalm 100 make a joyful shout to the lord all your lands serve the lord with gladness come before his presence with singing know that the lord he is god he is no, it is he who has made you and me, us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates. We're going to do one day with thanksgiving and into his courts, courts, courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Let's pray. Dear Almighty God, thank you so much for your forgiveness. Shh. Dear Almighty God, thank you so much for your forgiveness. Thank you so much for your patience. We don't deserve your blessings. That's why we worship your name, because you're kind. Lord, accept our worship this morning and bless all of us and help us to remain in you. In Jesus' pray, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Still, no, be still. Lord of the world. Wait, 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 where is it? It's not here.
the Lord. <clears throat> My Shout too loud. Shout as well. 
let's sing. The, the Bible doesn't yeah. say whisper to the Lord. Amen. Yeah, and shout the as well. The Bible says shout to the Lord. So you're okay, Pastor. Oh, that's you're fine. Okay. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we all stand up and shout together? Let's stand. And sing yes. What? <laughs> what a beautiful name. What a beautiful character. Amen. So we're going to continue our service uh, um, at this time. We mentioned, um, uh, we know that uh, we're still collecting our, we're not coming around with a plate like we used to. Um, uh, I was in Dundee last week um, preaching, and it was very strange for me because it's the first time I've seen an offering plate passed around <laughs> for so long now. So that was, it was um, very odd for me 
here. We're still collecting on the side here, so after the service, if you haven't already, feel free to do so. The information will be up on the screen at the end as well if you want to do so digitally, um, uh, kind of whichever is, is convenient for you. Um, we know this last week we've had, um, it's been a, a busy week for the Adventist Church um, as we've had the general conference session um, uh, over in the U.S., um, St. Louis, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we've had the general conference session uh, two years late um, from what it was supposed to be. Yeah, it's supposed it was supposed to be now. summer of 2020. Um, so it's finally come through. So I think some of the big headlines for anybody who hasn't previously heard, so um, Pastor Ted Wilson has been re-elected for a third term. Um, as, as, the, as the president of the World Church. We have um, f uh, the TED, so we've got uh, Dr. Daniel Duda, who many of you will have heard, heard speak before. He's, spoke, um, he's, he's, he's spoken here in, in Scotland many times. Um, so he's, he's now been um, uh, taken up the role of the president of the Trans-European Division, uh, taking over from Pastor Afat Kamal. Um, uh, so that's... Uh, a very good thing, a very, um, very good man. Um, we've, I say, we've heard him preach many times. He has a lot of um, very useful things to say. Um, and I know uh, Pastor Audrey, um, Audrey Anderson as well, she's been promoted to a general vice president of the, um, of the general conference. So again, somebody else from the um, Trans-European Division, somebody um, many of you may know. Um, I know her. Um, uh, again, somebody who's, who's done a lot of work here in the UK um, is now one of the general vice presidents of the of the Adventist Church, which is is wonderful news. There were a lot of, I looked at the list of nominations, uh, uh, the, the list of votes, and there's like 100 names, so I'm not going to go through all of them. <laughs> um, uh, but, but I think those are the ones that probably most directly affect us here. Um, but that's wonderful to see that, um, that going on, and uh, um, I've certainly, I haven't seen any controversy. I don't know whether Gabriel looks at different things to, to what I have, but that's, uh, so that's always a good thing. Um, when we get through a general conference without significant controversy, that's, um, that's always a blessing. Um, and seeing, I don't know, any of you have seen perhaps Pastor Dan, who, again, you probably know from, from being here, he's been doing a, a, a daily vlog um, from over there. So you see his um, behind the scenes and showing how they do the food for that many people. And um, uh, I've seen plenty of people posting, a lot of British um, people standing up and, and uh, making comments and so on. So we, we're definitely represented. Um, over there at the general conference session, which is wonderful. And of course, Pastor Jimmy, who was here two weeks ago, mm -hmm. our president here in Scotland, he's over there at the moment. Um, uh, he's over there as one of our, as the delegate representative for Scotland. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's very good. Um, so yeah, so we're thankful that that's um, been going well. I think it closes today, tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow is the, so will be the, the, the close of the whole thing. But I think all the main business is, is done. Um, uh, so hopefully tomorrow will just be the, the formalities to wrap up. Um, but that's always a blessing, and I think um, all the devotions and stuff—they're all on the web, all on the on YouTube. You can go and watch and see the the, the sermons and so on, which are which are there, um, which is wonderful. So at this time, we're gonna um, we're gonna pray. Um, so I'd ask that you adopt whatever position is comfortable you as we come before our Lord in, in prayer at this time, as we give thanks for this and um, and many other things that He's been doing for us. Our most kind and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your mercies towards us. Dear Lord, we, we recognize the blessing there is to be able to come together on, on the Sabbaths to, to worship you, to have our own, our own building where we can come together and, and praise your name. We can recognize you as our, as our creator each Sabbath, as our redeemer each Sabbath. We can place our trust completely in you and, and live our lives accordingly. We're so thankful for this privilege that we have, dear Lord. We recognize the, the, the freedom we have here in, in Dunfermline in Scotland, um, the, the wonderful freedom we have to recognize your leading, to see your, your hand as you're bringing new people um, uh, to us as, you, as you're stretching out your, your work in this community, as you see people who are, who are interested in, in you and learning more about you. And we're so thankful for these opportunities we have to, sh to share, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we know the, the prayer that you will always, always answer is to show us your leading in our, in our lives for the benefit of others. That you may fill us with your Holy Spirit and a love for, for the people all around us that we can share with them 
uh, through our works, our, our words, um, the, the way we treat people, the, every aspect of our lives, we can share your love with this, with the people of this world, the people who so desperately need to hear you and mm -hmm. to hear of how much you love them, that you died to save them and that you have a plan for their lives. So Lord, we ask that you will bless the, the work the, that we do, that you will guide the work that we, will, that we do, that you will show us the way that we need to step forward, the direction we need to, we need to travel so that we can, we can correctly follow your path here. So Lord, we ask you to be with Pastor Gabriel as he is um, with us again to, to, to share your word, that you will um, bless the, the message that he has for us today. I ask that you will bless the, the rest of the families who know they've been um, struggling with sickness this week, which is why we only have um, half the family here, that you will be with um, you will uh, be with Jessica and Ellen and, and Maddie at home, um, uh, that you will bring them back to us again soon as well. So Lord, we thank you for traveling mercies for all of the people we have visiting with us today, um, that you will grant them... Uh, continue to grant them traveling mercies with their onward, um, their onward journeys as well, uh, that you will bless them wherever it is they need to be. So Lord, we know that there are many um, of our own who are, uh, who are away this Sabbath. We're, we're missing so many people from our, from our church family. So Lord, we're, we ask that wherever they are, they may receive a Sabbath day's blessing, that you may be with them, that those who are, who are ill, you may, you may strengthen and protect them and bring them back soon, those who are traveling, um, that you will bring them back to us again soon as well, um, that we can continue to to swell here and not just fill this church, but um, fill more churches here in this, in this part of the world, to fill, to fill living rooms, to fill halls, to fill all kinds of places with, with people who are excited for your soon coming. So, Lord, please be with us now through the rest of this service. And we thank you for all that you do for us here. You've done in the general conference that you've done in so many different ways. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So I'll ask the children if they want to come forward. Sorry. I'll ask the children if they want to come forward for a children's story. As uh, Pastor Gabriel has, has something for you. So you want to grab your traditional seats at all? on the front here, and then Gabriel will share with us. Good morning, kids. Uh oh good morning. Uh oh good morning. How are you guys doing? I see a little one over here. Come on over here. Come on, Agatha, right over here. There you go. Any other ones over there? You guys want to come join us? Yeah, come join us. Yeah, the, the platform is large enough. Well, I'm going to tell you guys uh, an interesting little story. But before that, I'm going to show you guys something that I have here with me. In my backpack or briefcase, whatever I'm carrying, I usually carry a whole bunch of these. What are these? What are these, guys? They're horses, right? No, they're pens. You were right. I'm just joking. Everybody got confused for a really quick second. So these are pens. I have fountain pens, and I have pencils, and I have an Apple pencil, and then I have some other just fun little pens. So I have all of these things here, and every time you see me, I usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm usually carrying a pen. I like to write things down, mainly because I'm getting old and I forget a lot. Not that older people forget things, but I'm forgetting things. I didn't look at you, Fizz. I was just joking. And I, write to, I like to write things down, but also when I'm using my Bible, I like to underline in my Bible, and I usually carry a little notebook that I can write some ideas and different things on, and I keep these with me all the time. Now, this pen and this bigger brother here, these are two of my favorite, if not probably my favorite pens. These were a gift from the group of elders from my last church before we came to Scotland. They said a goodbye present for me, and they get me two really nice pens, and I always have these with me. Now... All these pens are special. I pick, I have a whole bunch of pens, more pens at home. But these are special for me because I keep them with me in my backpack at all times. But here's the thing. As much as I love these pens, what if God were to tell me, Gabriel, I know you really like your pens. They're really special to you. The pencils and, 
and the fountain pens and the ballpoint pens. I know they're really special to you, but I think I want you to give them back to me. <gasps> There's a problem there, but Lord, these were special pens. They were given to me, and I collected them, and I like them because they're so pretty. What if God asks you to give him something, but not just any little something, what if God is asking you to give him the most special thing you have? In the book of Genesis, chapter 22, there's a very important passage. You find that Abraham has finally had his son, the promised son that would come through Sarah. Anybody remember Abraham's son's name? What's his name? Isaac, Isaac that's right. And Abraham was so excited because Isaac was growing up. He was doing really well. And then when Isaac turned and became a teenager, probably about the age of 13, 14 years old, God told Isaac, God told Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take the son whom you love, and I want you to take him to the place that I'm going to tell you, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. In other words, I want you to give me that thing that you, that you treasure so much, and I want you to give him to me. It's like God telling one of us, saying, hey, take the most the most beautiful, most important toy that you have in your room. Can you guys think, what, what's my favorite toy? What do I go with everywhere with me and in road trips and to church and to friends? And we have that one thing or those two things that we carry with us. Now, why would God want Abraham to give Isaac to him? Why would God want things from us or people from us? See, here's the thing. Isaac, people, or pens and things... Or your cars or your careers when you go off and, and go to university and you start your careers. All of these things are important. But God is asking, where is your heart in all of this? In other words, do you love these things so much that maybe they come before me? See, these things are special because we give our heart to these things. We love and cherish these things. And that's okay. But is are they more special than God in our life? See, God was teaching Abraham a lesson. God was wanting Abraham to learn the truth and the center of love. That God is the center of love. Now, we can love people. We can love things and places and careers and jobs. But nothing should come before God himself. And Genesis chapter 22 in many ways, it's a frightening passage because what Abraham does, he takes Isaac and he puts him on the altar. And you find that Abraham then takes a knife and he's about to slaughter his own son like a, like a sheep that is slaughtered as a sacrifice to God. And then the Lord stops his hand. I want us to know something. I want us to understand something. As you grow older, there's going to be a lot of things that you love. There's going to be a lot of people that you love. And God doesn't want to take these things away from you. He just wants your life to be put in the right order and the things that you have in the right order. God wants to make sure that as you grow up, and he wanted Isaac to learn the lesson as well, that God is the person and the thing that we should love the most. And then family, of course, and then friends, and then whatever else, your careers and your studies and the material things that you may gather. But it becomes dangerous when all of these other things take God's place. In fact, the very first commandment that we read in the Bible in Exodus 20 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. As you go home, you should be grateful to God for the things he gives you. Your clothes and your shoes and a good house and a warm bed and the food and your, all these other things. But you should always say, Lord, I love these things, and I love my family, but help me to always love you first and above everything else. I'll close with one little thought. When you turn on the TV with your family or whenever you're with your friends, we're in a world that is filled with people that are in love with, with consuming things and gathering things and having things. And I'm a little guilty of that with all the pens here in front of you. But God is wanting to make sure that as much as we live in this world, that we shouldn't give our love away to the world. Our love should be reserved 
first and foremost for God. Can we remember that? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for prayer. Lord, thank you so much because we know that you love us. Not only do you love us more than the universe and the things in it, you love us more than you even love yourself that you would be willing to die for us. Lord, teach us to love you the same way, that as these kids grow up, that as much as they like their shoes and their toys and their dresses and their friends and all these other things, that these children may learn to offer these things to you, to say, Lord, we love you above everything and anything else in our life. May our children grow up to be those beautiful Christians. And us as adults, May we follow the same principle and the same teaching. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd ask, can you help me take these back? I'll just put one of these in my pocket. You guys can go back to your seats with your parents, and I'll give this to Hadassah. You'll just put it right next to my backpack. Okay, take them with you there. You have big hands? I have too many pens, I think. Here you go. Before we have our sermon, then we're going to have um, a hymn, with, uh, which is hymn number 461, Be Still My Soul, The Lord is on Thy Side. Shall we stand for this, um, for this hymn? <laughs>
Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, uh, Stephen. We really, I really, really enjoyed that hymn. Thank you for picking that hymn. Be still my soul. Good morning, everyone. Whoa, good morning, everyone. I thought it was just the children, but I guess it's, maybe we'll open the doors and let some fresh air come in. Can, uh, Charles, can you pop that window open? And Ishvan, okay, that window's open there. Just kind of get some fresh air in here for everybody. Um, it's good to be with you guys this wonderful Sabbath morning. Um, the original plan, I wasn't planning to be here today. I was going to be in one of our other churches, but I spoke to the person that was going to be preaching and I said, hey, can we make a little bit of a swap? Uh, even though I was with you guys two Sabbaths ago on the 28th, uh, we had, the, for those of you guys that are visiting, below me is a baptistry, all right? So we had this filled a couple of weeks ago, and we had some baptisms here. Some of us are, some of them are not here, but Isvan, he was one of those who gave his life to the Lord two weeks ago. So Isvan, congratulations, brother. Uh, so it's good to be here. So I was here a couple of weeks ago. We had Pastor Jimmy Botha who was preaching. Uh, I was here doing the baptisms. But I wanted to be here and share a little bit of God's word with you guys. Uh, and, and Keith, if you put the title up there, uh, the, the, the message is going to be focused on why does my faith remain small? Why does my faith remain small? So this is something that I've been studying for myself uh, more as a reflection of my own journey with God, my own relationship with Jesus, uh, the study of his word. And I figured there are some things that the Lord has taught me through this experience that I wanted to share with each one of you guys and the rest of our church as well. Now, the word small is relative to every person. What may be small to one person may be a huge amount of faith to another. Uh, the small faith to one person may keep them from going and stepping upon the water, but the small faith to another is what leads them to actually walk upon the water. But we're going to talk about what are the things, the mindsets, what are the perhaps some character flaws that may hamper us or keep uh, God from growing our faith and growing our relationship with you. But what are also some things that God is calling you in your life to walk closer with him in order for your faith to expand and your, your trust and your obedience in him to also expand and grow as well. Before we begin, there's one, I just want to share two very important things. Uh, number one, um, yes, my, my wife and two of my kids are the oldest and the youngest are, are sick this morning. They're, they're at home. Uh, had a little bit of a stomach bug going on and they are home resting. However, before we begin, I can't, talking about faith, um, my, my family and I, we shared with our chats, our group chat here with our churches, all three of our churches, of a tremendous answered prayer. For those of you guys that remember or don't know, my mother-in-law uh, was diagnosed with terminal cancer, stage four cancer at the start of last summer, a year ago. Um, the doctors gave her just a few months to live. She went through chemo, radiotherapy, the mass in her colon and her, her abdomen area weren't going away. Um, and the doctors pretty much told her, hey, you probably won't make it to the end of this summer. That was in February of this year. Um, she went for a scan on Thursday. Uh, late in the evening, she called us uh, yesterday morning with just the most ridiculously, in human terms, amazing answer to prayer. Uh, when she went to get her MRI scan and then the, I think it's the PET scan that she got done, when she went through this process of trying to see what's going on just to see if the, any of the treatments, uh, including immunotherapy, were helping, they didn't find one, one mass in her abdomen nor anywhere else in her body. The doctor, the oncologist who was talking to her, uh, Dr. Vasquez, said she's never seen anything like this in her life. It was the very first time that somebody has gone from terminal cancer, going through all the process, and even after they went through all the chemo, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, they still found masses. They waited a month, and a month on Thursday, everything was completely gone. And that is a tremendous answer to prayer. And I'll tell you something right now. It's not necessarily the faith prayer of one individual. I think it's the communal faith experience. Uh, we know that all of you and your families have been praying for my mother-in-law, have been praying for our family, um, and we know that we continue to pray for one another. But faith isn't just trusting God whenever He heals or whenever He says yes. Faith is also trusting God whenever God says no. As you guys know, two and a half years ago, my father passed away from cancer. To my father, he said no. To my mother-in-law, he said yes. Faith is not about saying, I'm going to determine God's answers being good or bad based upon my evaluation or my estimation. Sometimes God gives us a raise and then we get in a car accident and there goes our raise. 
sometimes we go throughout our life being completely healthy. We retire and then we're diagnosed with cancer like my father was. Here's the thing. Faith isn't trusting God only when you evaluate things are from God. But whenever difficulties and challenges come from God, well, this, this must not be from God. This must be from the enemy. Faith is trusting God amidst walking in the midst, walking in the fog, just holding on to his, to his dear hand as we go through that journey. However, as we go through this process here, this, this question of why does our faith remain small, it's also saying, Lord, are you satisfied with where I am with you right now? Don't ask yourself. In fact, it would be quite convenient at times for me to say, well, I think I'm okay with Jesus right now. I think I go to church enough. I, I return tithes. I help around. No, the question shouldn't be, Lord, how's my walk with you? What's my relationship with you like? It shouldn't be my understanding, but allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you and say, hey, I believe it's perfectly possible that I want your faith to grow, your relationship with me to become firmer, your faith in me to become more of a resilient faith. And I can tell you right now, I believe that what we have gone through in the past 36 months as a world through going through, through, through a health crisis such as COVID, going through war, now going through financial recession around the world as I look at the prices of fuel in America, not much better than what they're happening here. Clearly, just in the past 36 months, war, pandemic, and now financial economic catastrophes. Here's the thing. If during these moments that we're going through, our faith has remained the same, then we must ponder and ask ourselves, why? Why is our faith staying the same? So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. We, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us and to speak to us this morning as we go into his passage, into this passage. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much because you're so patient with us. Just looking at Jesus' relationship with his 12 disciples, they saw all your miracles, your, your power. They saw your compassion and your mercy and your forgiveness for humanity and yet, when it came down to it and Jesus was going to be betrayed, they all fled. But yet you were patient with them. Father, you look at each one of us here. You know our hearts. You know our own individual relationship with you and our journey with you. And we, I have no question that where we are may not be where you want us to be. Even when things are good, there's still something better. Even when circumstances in our life are in a decent situation and we feel that our walk with you is in an okay, stable situation, there's still so much more you want to expose us to. So Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit, as we study your inspired word, that your Holy Spirit may speak to each one of us. Not just corporately as a, as a church, those that are watching online, those that are in person, but individually. So Lord, we ask that you help us to study this passage and to glean and conclude the things that you want us to conclude. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking at two chapters this morning. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. You can follow along on your devices as well. We'll try and put the passages up on the screen, but don't, don't do it consistently. <laughs> I want people to follow along on their devices and on their Bibles. If you are using a device, uh, I just ask that you put your phone on do not disturb or on airplane mode. We want to make sure that nothing will interfere our time with God this morning. Also, if somebody doesn't have a Bible, will you please share with them? We want to make sure that everybody's able to follow along as much and as best as possible. So we're going to look at starting with Numbers chapter 13, but Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14 go hand in hand. Numbers chapter 13, we find God communicating with the people of Israel as they have vacated and left the land of Egypt. They've gone through receiving the commandments of God. They've seen God part the waters. They've seen God do some amazing things in their life. And now they're at the point where they have they're crossing, about to cross over into the land that belongs to the Canaanite nations. Nations meaning plural. This is the region that ultimately is the land where Abraham was led to. He left Ur of the Chaldeans, the Babylonian region. And he went east, well, excuse me, westward towards Israel. What we call Israel now was Canaan. We find that his son Isaac also inhabits this area. Jacob inhabits this area. And ultimately, they're led down to Egypt by Joseph in the time of famine and drought. 
And now the Lord, after 400 years of being slaves in Egypt, the Lord wants to take them from where they used to be to where he wants them to be. But it's interesting how God approaches this. When you look at this passage, let me give you a little bit of a geographical understanding. My palm is the land of Canaan. This other palm down here is Egypt. When God brought the people out of Egypt to the promised land, the land of Canaan, he didn't come directly going south to conquer the land going north. In fact, the Lord took the long route and he started from Kadesh in the north and he worked his way down to Jericho to the south all the way to Beersheba in the land of Judah. Why did God not just go take a direct route to here? Why did he start from the north coming down? We're going to talk about that. As we're going through this passage, the people of Israel at this point in time, they're excited. They've seen God do some amazing feats. They've seen him work amongst uh, uh, Moses and Aaron. They've seen that God can truly do some amazing things. And we get to chapter 13. They're on the north side of the region of Canaan. And it says this, chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord God spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So the very first thing I want us to do, to learn from this passage in why our faith remains small and ultimately how we can make a change and allow the Lord to transform where we are in our relationship with Him, our walk with Him, our trust, our obedience, our faith, to where He ultimately wants to take us. The first thing we read about this passage is at this moment in time, the people trusted God. See, the Lord had done some amazing things in the past. There was no reason why they shouldn't trust God as they were to about, about to step into the future. So when God told Moses, Moses, I want you to gather the 12 tribes and pick a leader from amongst them. I want you to go and send them to spy out the land, to investigate, to look what the land and the people are like, to look at the cities, to look at what they're gardening, what their fields are like, to see what kind of animals dwell there. Here's the thing. The reason why God is sending them down initially is because the people had been in slavery in Egypt for so long that they forgot what that land looked like. God wanted to remind the people of why he was leading them to this point. Here's the thing. Up to this point, yes, they trusted God in many ways because of all the things that God had done. But he sends a group of spies into the region of Canaan so that when they come back, they can remind the people, this is why I'm bringing you here. Here's the thing, oftentimes it's difficult for us to understand where God is trying to take us because we spend too much time dwelling upon the past. There are so many circumstances in the past that can actually keep your faith from being a simple young faith to a mature, expanding, amazing faith. Now I know we took some time and looked around the room. Some of us have been through such horrific things in our life. As many of you guys know, I was molested and raped by, as, a, as a young boy at the age of five and six by an older cousin. I've met many of you guys in our church district and across the world who have been a, a faced different types of abuse and rape. You've seen murder. You've seen robbery. You've seen so many different things. Loved ones die. And here's the thing. Egypt, in many ways, is representing a lot of our past. But because we have lived so long in a time of turmoil, difficulty, and challenges in our life, it's difficult for us to understand, God, where are you taking me? In fact, even when we get to chapter 14 in this passage, you, you find that the people of Israel, they see what lies ahead, and they think that remaining in the past, going back to Egypt, is still a good idea. One of the reasons why our faith remains small is because we're not willing to allow God to have victory over our past. We're, we're allowing our past to define not just our present, but to define our future. And we find that God is benevolent. He says, okay, you guys are scared. I understand. You, you've seen me do some amazing things, but you're still hesitant. You're still frightened about what may come. So God, out of his benevolence, meaning out of his goodness, he says, I'm only going to send 12 of you. I'm only going to send 12 of you to the promised land. 
They're going to go and they're going to spy out what's going to happen. We need to see how God is operating. In order to have access to a mature faith, a growing relationship with Him, we need to allow for God to separate what has happened in our experience in the past, broken relationships, illness, financial catastrophes, warfare, anything that He wants to release us from that in order to take us where He wants to take us. But He says, I'm going to take you slowly because I know that your faith is fragile. Let's be honest for a second. Think about the challenges that we face in just the past 36 months. How that has affected our relationship with one another, our relationship with God. But God's benevolence says, I'm not going to prematurely take you to a place without you seeing what lies ahead. Now, God originally, as he sent the 12 spies into the land of Egypt, it was so they can know the strategy in which to approach the land. But also that they can see that somebody who has been in that land can come back and share their witness, their testimony. God has brought us to a good place. Now, I'll tell you something right now. I want you to pause for a second. It's perfectly acceptable to be amongst the people who remained on the north side before the 12 tribes, the 12 spies went in. It, you may not be the type of person who says, Lord, I'll go. Hey, I have faith. I, you may not be the person who says, I'll go and I'll spy out the land. I'll make heavy notes. I'll see what's going on. I'll do a demographic study. I'll see what's happening with the illnesses, what kind of, what kind of crops. I'll, Lord, I want to do that. And some of, some, of, some of us amongst us are those individuals. But it's okay to be amongst those that says, I'm going to wait and trust the Lord and those that he has appointed. But it's dangerous whenever the report comes back and we trust the words of men rather than the words of God. Look at the second thing that happens. Looking at the passage, verse, verse 2, we read that they went. God sent these spies. By the way, uh, the Hebrew word spies was quite interesting to me. The Hebrew word in, uh, for spy is tur or tor. And the idea is somebody who doesn't go as a military spy, but comes more as a tax assessor. A tax assessor looks, okay, the, look at the square footage of this room. Okay, they have three bathrooms. Okay, we, okay, their garden is this dimension. Okay, they have two cars. They are wanting to assess what is there. The idea of spy has a military idea. Now, ultimately, we do see that there is military action when you finally re get to the book of Joshua and they actually go into the promised land through the region of Jericho. We find that there's military action. But before there is might, before there is power demonstrated by the military action of Israel, there is first trust in God saying this is what's going on. I'm going to pause here. This is not one of the things that I added to my, to my sermon, but I, I do want to pause here. The people of Israel, when they sent the spies into the, into the land of Canaan, it wasn't to confront the Canaanites. It wasn't to start a fight. It wasn't to judge. It wasn't to condemn. It was to be aware and to assess of where they were going. I'm going to tell you something right now. One of the biggest challenges that Christians have today, that as Adventists we have today, is that we see the world as the enemy. Humanity is not the enemy of God. It's sin. It is what Paul calls in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. It's the principalities and powers. Jesus loved the world that he came to die for humanity. When we see the world, it's important to get God's perspective, his, his view on humanity, not ours. These 12 spies went to assess, say, okay, we're assessing the crops, we're assessing the region and the lands, but we're also trying to assess people. What are the struggles that people have? If we find one of, the medical, one of the greatest medical struggles that we have here in Scotland is colon cancer. We also find that here in Scotland there's a tremendous depression and anxiety challenges. There's high rates of alcoholism. See, if I were a spy sent to the region of Scotland, I need to see what are people's struggles in that land. So that we may know what God wants to do not just for us but through us to minister to the people. So the first part, these are the, that's the mindset of the spies. They're more tax assessors, so to speak. Looking at verse 17, I'm jumping around a little bit. Look at verse 17, chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains. 
So he starts from the north, as we mentioned, and Kadesh went all the way south to Beersheba. It would have been so much more economic. It would have been so much easier to move all the people if God would have just come from Egypt straight north, going through the south side to what now is Judah, and then conquered on the way to the north. But God started from the north and worked his way south. We find in the book of Isaiah, by the way, chapter 14, uh, verse 13, you find that it's a description of Lucifer and his rebellion against God, where he says, I will be like the most high. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. But ultimately, when you get to verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 14, I, uh, the, the, the idea, the mindset of Lucifer says, I will ascend to the north. Because in Scripture, the north represents God's dwelling. Now, we're not just talking about north like on the, the four-dimensional compass. The north is indicative and representative of God's throne room, His seat. When you look at the temple and you look at the sanctuary, the people would come in from the east and they travel to the west. But you find that when you look at the bread, it's on the north side. This camp that the people of Israel were in and the tabernacle was the center, but it was also the northern parts of the camp where the tabernacle was set up. And we find that God's seat, that throne room, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the throne of God is a throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. See, when God started from the north on his way south, he sent the spies to the land to reveal the goodness of God, to reveal the mercy, the love, the forgiveness of God. See, they did not come with soldiers and weapons. They came with a message. Now, ultimately, we do find that it wasn't the Canaanites that rejected God. It wasn't the Canaanites that said, okay, we need to gather all our armies, all the different kings of Canaan, because there were multiple kings in Canaan. We're not going to gather all our armies and fight against Israel. No, it was actually the incredulous, the lack of faith of Israel that led to the hardness of heart of the people around them. Nobody was bearing arms. Nobody was fighting against Israel. These spies traveled from the north going south, just like any trader would come to go to the market. On the northern side of Canaan, you find the regions of Tyre and Sidon. This was a marketplace right by the sea. When people would travel from east to west, when people come, came from overseas over the waters, they would stop there and they would travel south towards Egypt. It was normal for people to come from the north to the south to bring good things to trade with the Canaanites. But in this case, the people of Israel were not at the north. They weren't trading goods. They were trading hope. They were bringing the message of God. That was what they had to offer to the people in the land of Canaan. But the people in, of Israel, their faith was in themselves. Their faith was not in what God was trying to tell or do through them. They were afraid for their well-being. When you look at verse 17, this idea of the north coming south is God's ministry through his people coming to the globe, coming to that region, that geographical land. Let's go to the next portion here. Looking at verse, uh, we're going to look at verse 23. So the, you find that the spies, including Caleb and, and Joshua, they go into the land with 10 other spies. They come back and look what happens in verse 23. They came to the valley of Eshel and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried in between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshel because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. When you find that these 12 tribes, these 12 spies, excuse me, they go down to the nation, to the land of Canaan. When they come back, you can see them holding on like you, like whenever in the old days and in many parts around the world, they would carry the lamb or the cow or the goat hung, hanging upside down. It was to be put and cooked. To them, they saw that the land of, e the land of Canaan had grapes that were massive size grapes. Now, we're not talking about the size of the grape itself, the individual grape, but the cluster of grapes was great. Meaning that region 
was able to not just sustain grapes that were small, but a large amount of grapes. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means. The temperature has to be just right. The soil can't be too wet and it can't be too dry. We have uh, Tyler here from SoCal. You, you're aware of all the vineyards in central and southern California, all over the place. That's why California became the place that everybody wanted to go to as America was being founded going west because it was the land of plenty. Many people called California the land of milk and honey because it's very similar to what was happening in that region. This was representative of the things that God had in store for those that were to enter the land of Canaan. These spies, when they brought back, the first report that they brought was the bounty. And it was a non-verbal communication. They were carrying with them this cluster of grapes, carrying with them pomegranates. When the people saw these spies returning after 40 days, they should have been excited for what God had planned for them. Now, I want us to understand something, but also to clarify something. We need to understand that when God brought these spies to see the, all that was in that region, they brought back these two things. They were representing the representative of God's bounty that was prepared for God's people. He wanted them to understand that as he brought them to the land of Canaan, they would never have to do without. But I want to clarify something. Wealth is not a determination of God's favor or God's favoritism. Position, title, status, these things are not necessarily from God to say, oh, well, clearly this person must be blessed from God and this person isn't. It is only the bounty that is promised is only to be received, excuse me, it's not only, it's the, the bounty that is promised to be received by everybody who is willing to step out in obedience and in faith to where God wants to take you. Now, the pomegranates, if you find it, pomegranates, when you open it up, they're like little grapes inside with their own seeds. I was reading this amazing Bible commentary, Adam Clark's Bible commentary, and was mentioning that to some, the bounty and the blessing would be large. To others, the bounty and blessing will be enough. That's an important understanding in God's providence. To some, as he crossed into the land of Canaan, the bounty, meaning their inheritance would be large. Some would receive massive clusters of grapes. But to others, God's provision would be enough. Here's the thing. Many times our faith remains small. Because we're too busy comparing what we have instead of what God, excuse me, comparing what we have with what others have. We look at what this person may have, look at their lifestyle perhaps, looking at their health, looking at their age, looking at their title, looking at their positions, and we begin to compare, well, why do they get grapes and I get these little grapes called pomegranates? How come this person may have so much? And in many times and in many ways, even in church it happens, wow, man, Charles plays the piano, Charles plays the guitar, he can work on graphic design, he's an engineer, he can preach, and we begin to even compare ourselves with the blessings that God gives to an individual. Here's the thing, we have to understand that God's bounty is given to everybody. To some, the favor may be large, but it's never for themselves, as we learned this morning in the Sabbath school study. And to others, what God gives you is enough to sustain you. It's the same thing that we find with the practice of the manna that comes down from heaven. God rained manna down from heaven. They were supposed to pick a portion enough for the individuals in their household. If they were to pick too much and store it, what, was, what would happen to the manna if I just stuck it in the pantry and said, oh, I'll eat it tomorrow morning? It would go bad and mold and rot. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something right now. One of the most catastrophic things that happens in the Christian experience in the Adventist church is when we begin to evaluate the things that others have instead of being satisfied with what we have. I had a conversation with a colleague uh, when we were coming here to Scotland uh, probably one of the greatest blessings that I received from somebody coming, coming here to Scotland. In coming here to Scotland from Texas, a majority of the folks that I talked to were like, are you sure God is taking you to Scotland? I mean, things are going pretty well for you here. But I was reminded about this conversation with my friend. If he hadn't messaged me three weeks ago, I probably would have forgotten it, but he messaged me three weeks ago. And he, he asked how things were going here in Scotland. And he reminded me of what he first told me. He says, Scotland 
is a land of plenty, but the soil still has to be prepared. Here in Scotland, we have, for those of you guys that are visiting, we have about 700 plus Seventh-day Adventist Christians in Scotland. It's a small country. The gospel is still small. But he said something that impacted me so much four years ago and reminded me again three weeks ago. That the land where we reside is a land of plenty. The responsibility is for us to work the soil. To prepare to receive what God wants to offer us. Whether that be grapes or whether that be pomegranates. If I look on Facebook and look at all my friends, oh man, look at all their experiences in America and around the world. Wow, that's awesome. And it can be so easy to fall into the trap of saying, but hold on, I'm a Christian too. Jesus, I read your Bible. I go to church. I return tithe. How, why is it that every month I'm barely getting by? And why is it that others have so much? We find that the disciples made the same mistake even after Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 21, Jesus is with Peter and John. And Jesus tells Peter the famous story, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? At the end of all these things, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says that three times. But then Peter looks at John. He says, Lord, what about this guy? And Peter says, I mean, the Lord says to Peter, Peter, don't worry about him. Worry about you and I. See, many times our faith remains small because we're too busy comparing what others have with what we have. If there is something to be yearned about others' experience is the faith that Caleb and Joshua had versus the other ten. I can't tell you how often we see this in the Bible where we're too busy evaluating the possessions, the belongings that others have. And not possessing the one thing that is important most is the faith and the relationship in the giver, not just in what the giver gives. Looking at the next passage. So here we find the tremendous bounty that the Lord had prepared for them. Looking at verse 25. It says, they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Pause for a second. Um, something I didn't include here in my notes, but something I do, that I do want to share with you. We find that this idea of 40, this number 40 is repeated many, 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 many times in Scripture. The most common conclusion of the number 40 is that God is in the process of refining in, those, in that number 40. We find that whenever the world was flooded, it rained for 40 days and 49, the Lord was refining creation. We find this idea when the people of Israel, they went to the land to spy the region of Israel. They were, they were assessing, but the Lord was refining their trust. Look at all the things I'm going to provide for you. He was refining their faith and their trust in Him. We, we find that the next few chapters, after chapter 14 and chapter 15, when the people of Israel didn't trust God and where God wanted to take them, they had to go through 40 years of being refined in the wilderness. The number 40 is repeated as an idea of refining and it oftentimes has to do with one's individual experience with God. So they were in the land. It wasn't a quick, hey, let me go in there, sneak in, sneak out. 40 days is a long period of time to be in a region of people that you don't know. But they went and they assessed. Coming back now, let's go to verse 27. Verse 27. Then they told him, talking about their speaking to Moses. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where, they, where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They brought back a tremendous report of what God has done. And I'll share with you, and I'll repeat it one more time. The healing that has happened with my mother-in-law is the report of milk and honey. The healing of my mother-in-law is the report of grapes and pomegranates. But it's your perspective that'll make the difference do you see that it's oh it's just an accident oh it's just medical science or is it God working in the life of my mother-in-law and how are you going to interpret this is it possible that the mindset of those who saw the grapes that saw the pomegranates that heard the report of milk and honey is it possible that the hundreds of thousands and millions of Israelites they could have said look at what God has promised look at what God has done I'm going to step forward in faith or are you going to stay there and the same just Sunday morning comes along, it's Sunday. Monday, it's Monday. Tuesday, is Tuesday. Or are you going to pursue your week with the faith that if God can do this in the life of one person, he can do it in our life as well? Here's the thing. 
all of these miraculous things that the Lord does, all of these answered prayers, or to fortify your faith in the one who has done these things. Guys, I can tell you how many times we allow the blessings of God to go in one ear and out the other without even reaching our hearts. These things that we hear about the blessings of God, whether we determine to be small or great, are intended not just for the blessing of the one who has received it. It's intended for the, those that hear it, that a change can happen in the way we perceive God, in the way we trust God. I shared this report with you about my mother-in-law, not just because it's an answer to prayer to us. It's also meant to strengthen your faith. In God. I mean, how often do you find four doctors doing these, these analysis and these strategies and going through chemo and radiation? How often do you find the report of all of them is, we don't know how it happened. It must have been a miracle. How often do you hear that in the world today? Here's the thing. Caleb and Joshua, they said, you sent us down there. We saw, we evaluated, and it is a land of plenty. The people should have been like, yes, let's go. But do you know why our faith oftentimes remains small? Because there were 10 that said the following. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once, take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Verse 31. But the man who had gone up with him, meaning the other ten, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel bad report of the land which they had spied out. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all people. Who, are, who we see in it are men of great stature. Verse 33, then we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. We were like grasshoppers in our sight. And so we were in their sight. One of the reasons our faith remains small is because we may be too occupied in listening to others instead of listening to God. We may be too occupied in listening to the incredulous, weak faith of even other believers. And we trust them. Instead of saying, God, you sent us there. They brought back these grapes, these pomegranates, this amazing report. Clearly, this is the place you want us to go. But, oh, but no, there's 10 others that are saying. And sometimes we make the incorrect evaluation that the majority must be telling the truth. And the minority can't be, re can't be trusted. Our faith can remain small and hampered when we allow the words, the testament of others to supersede the testament of God. It even happens amongst God's people. Yes, these 10 men that brought this bad report saying, oh, we're grasshoppers, they're giants. Their cities are large. Their inhabitants are clearly going to defeat us. These weren't just 10 average men. These were the 10 princes from amongst the tribes. They were the heads, the leaders of the tribes. Church friends, I'm telling you something right now. If you depend too heavily upon the faith and the walk of others, instead of the faith and the message that God has given you, it can be very easy for you to be misled or for your faith to just stay like this. Not mature, not expand. Do not grow. We find that even with the, Jesus' own disciples, when you read Matthew chapter 25 and Matthew chapter 26, Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 26 that he needs to go to Jerusalem. And the disciples are like, no, Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. They want to kill you there. They tried to stop Jesus from doing what he knew God wanted him to do. We find the same thing with the disciples in, after Jesus has gone to heaven. Paul had anointed Paul and Barnabas to go out and spread the gospel. And some of the people were like, no, 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 we need Paul here. But God didn't call Paul to remain in Jerusalem with the other, the other apostles. He sent Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. If he had listened, he would have remained and the gospel would have been slowed down. Instead of there being three missionary journeys from Paul, there would have been maybe one. Here's the thing, church family, we have to understand this. Our belief... If our belief is matured, it can impact others in a positive way. 
But if our belief and our faith is mis misplaced, it not only hampers us, it hampers others' faith as well. You have to understand there is no in-between. You either trust God and step forward into the land of Canaan, or you trust men and remain where God does not want you to be. How often do we face catastrophic situations in our life because we're being obedient to what others around us are telling us? See, something like, God, why did you allow for this to happen? God's like, no, that was never my intention. But you chose not to step forward in faith. How many times we go through catastrophic situations in our marriages, in our finances, even in the church? And we're like, God, God, why is this happening? Why couldn't you do something? And God's over here saying, hey, I'm texting you. I'm trying to tell you where to go. I'm telling you, you shouldn't have stayed there. That was never my plan. But God always gets the short end of the stick whenever we face catastrophes in our life. Is it possible that we have gone or are going through something in our life that it was never God's intention, but we were misled by others around us? By listening too carefully to the words of others? Church friends, I'll tell you something right now. That passage is one of the most frightening passages in all of Scripture. Numbers chapter 13, verse 28 through 33 are one of the most frightening passages of all of Scripture. It parallels what we read in John chapter 6, verse 66. In John chapter 6, Jesus is telling the disciples and all the crowds, he had just multiplied the breads and the fish, and the crowds have followed him. And Jesus says, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. I gave you, God gave you, I'm the bread from heaven. And the people are like, what? No, no way. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders are like, no, we can't believe this. Jesus had hundreds of people that were his followers. But when you get to John chapter 6, verse 66, a.k.a. 666, you find that at that moment in time in John chapter 6, verse 66, the people said, this is a difficult teaching. And it says the phrase, and they walked with Jesus no longer. Jesus, while he walked on earth, and in this scenario in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, God does not want to leave you where you are because he knows what may come upon you when you remain outside of his will and outside of his plans. So he says, will you go to where I am sending you? Even when others are telling you it doesn't make any sense. Even when others don't understand. But here's the thing. God isn't asking you to imitate the faith of other believers He's asking you to imitate Christ's faith. To go forward when it doesn't make sense to others. To trust Him when it seems irrational. Our faith oftentimes remains so minuscule because our ears are filled with the noise of people. If there's a transition to be made in your life and in my life, is to spend more time listening to the still small voice than to listen to the voice of the crowds. When we don't spend enough time studying God's word, the voice is silent, it's quiet, it's whispered. Because there's so much noise. But if we were to mute and pause the, the noise that we hear and just listen to the voice, how clearly it is that God wants to take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. I don't believe, I don't believe that God is happy when we face illness, when we're struggling to make ends meet. I don't believe God is happy when you're struggling in your career, when you're struggling. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's God's plan. But the exposure to these things are to raise an awareness that God is able to deliver you from your current circumstances. If God were to ask you, I delivered you, and you say, well, God, what did you deliver me from? But if you've gone through illness, through relationship struggles, through financial struggles, through your career struggles, and God says, I want you to go here, and you step forward, and God says, I deliver you, like, God, thank you so much because you delivered me from these different things. Here's the thing. You know one of the reasons why, as Adventists and as Christians, we fail to celebrate the things of God? is because we have not accepted his reasoning to celebrate. Because we're still in the midst of the struggle. Many of us struggle with giving God praise being more thankful to God, celebrating the things of God because we have not stepped out in faith to the direction God wants to take us. Now, I'm not preaching to you prosperity gospel. That's not what I'm saying. Prosperity gospel is God's going to give you a blessing whether you want to or not. You can earn God's blessing. No, that's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying it's not God's blessing that he wants to take you alone. It's also God trying to deliver you from what you are going through. But if you are to be delivered, you have to make a choice. Am I going to follow the ten spies or the two? Am I going to shush the crowds and listen to the still small voice? Oftentimes that faith is so small because others stay here. And if the crowd is here, we'll just stay with them as well. Look at the next one here. Drawing almost to a close. Fizz, thank you, Fizz. Chapter 14, verse 2. Last three things. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Stop there. Do you know that grumbling and complaining not only is a result of small faith, it can also hamper the faith of others? Nowhere in the report do we find that Caleb and Joshua said that they wrote that the people of Canaan raised up soldiers or arms against them. No, it was the other incredulous 10 that said, we're grasshoppers, they're giants. By the way, uh, there is a guy who defeated a giant in the Bible, in the book of 1 Samuel. There is a guy who defeated a descendant of Anak. His name was David. It is perfectly possible to defeat giants with a sling and a stone, not even with the sword and a spear, right? But here you find that they're complaining They're afraid of people who are going to potentially raise arms against them, which they never had. I found this on the web. Thank you. (laughs) But here you find that when, and I want to make sure we all catch this, when your faith is inactive, meaning when you're not continually, not occasionally, when you're not continually stepping out in faith in the direction that God is leading you, and your faith remains inactive, you start to find something to be active about. And it's usually grumbling and complaining. It's accusing and maligning and judging and condemning. You know, I believe that in our church, and I say this regretfully, but honestly, I've been, in a, I've been a pastor long enough and in many different churches long enough to understand that the majority of our Seventh-day Adventist church is inactive. And the reason why children leave the church and people feel so upset, not just Adventism, Christianity as a whole, is because if we're not being active in pursuing God, we're being active in pursuing others, in maligning others, in accusing others. Here we find that our faith remains small, but not only does our faith remain small because of inactivity, that inactivity, that complacency, that indifference to the will and the work of God has adverse effects on others around us. They said to the point, It would have been better if we would have just gone back to Egypt, died as slaves in Egypt, or died in the wilderness and to die by the sword. As if God had not defeated the swords in three different events in the past. I'll tell you something right now. That our faith not only remains small when we're inactive, not pursuing and going after the things that God wants us to do, but unfortunately... Small faith is passed on to others around us. I'm not talking about just the neighbor sitting next to you, but to our children. Our children learn the manner of faith that we have. If you have indifference, if you're complacent, if our faith remains small, why should we be surprised if the faith of our children remains small to the point where oftentimes it can dwindle and then they exit a belief in God and belief in the church? Why are we surprised whenever our young people leave the church? What we should be surprised is why couldn't we have active faith while, we were, while they were young, while they were in our homes? Why is it that sometimes our children's Sabbath schools across the globe struggle? Our adventures and pathfinders struggle Our Sabbath schools struggle. Our Adventist elementaries and academies struggle. I I believe that if there is a small faith that needs to be addressed, 
is the faith of mom and dad. And having the, the, the conviction to say, I will not pass on this faith to my children. But letting our children see us in church being active. Amongst the community being active. Ministering to others' welfare. Providing for the needs and the struggles of others. See, if your child sees you go to church, they may go to church when they get older. But if your child doesn't see you go out to the people, don't be surprised if we can't convince them to go out to the people. If your children fill the pew, excuse me, if they children see you fill the pews, don't be surprised if they say, well, we go to church on Saturday or we go to church, but we just sit there. Here's the thing. Nowhere in Numbers chapter 13 or Numbers chapter 14 did God say, I'm going to take you to the north side of Canaan and you're going to live there. No. God says, I'm going to take you to the north land of Canaan with the point of starting from the top, going all the way to the bottom to deliver my grace message, my goodness message to the people that live in that land. God did not intend and still does not intend for us to reside where we are at this moment. The bounty of the gospel is for your family, for you, but it's also for others. Here we find that the people, because of an inactive faith, because of a small faith, something had to start, had to start. And it wasn't anything positive. It was complaining and grumbling. Ask yourself a question. Do you find yourself talking more about your struggles? Or about the blessings. Where you are. Or where God is taking you. The reality is this. Church family. Yes. In many ways our faith is small. But you shouldn't be satisfied where your faith is now. Where your relationship with God is now. Not when there are multiple points on your spiritual map. That he still wants to take you to. This church. For those of us that live here and serve here. This is not the end stop. We have a group that lives in Kirkcaldy. We have people that live in Sterling. We have people that live in West Lothian. We have people that live all the way to Gallus Hills. I'm visiting somebody in Gallus Hills. I have one church member that lives in Gallus Hills. I'm going to drive two hours <laughs> to visit this one lady in our church. But she's such a lovely lady, by the way. But we have people. Here's the thing. Worshiping in this church, being part of this church, is not the end of the road. There are 5.7 million people that yet have to hear the beauty of God's love, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion. Serving here is just one of the stops along the path that God wants to take you. I'll close with the last thing here. Verse 34. Acts, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. says this. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land... 40 days. For each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. It's frightening to even hear those words from God's mouth. You will know my rejection. Jesus. In the life with his disciples, was always taking them to new places. First, around the region of Capernaum in Galilee. Then he went a little bit further out to Jerusalem. Then he went further out to Samaria. Then he went to the Syrophoenician woman outside of the borders of Israel. In other words, Jesus started from the inside, made the circle larger and larger. Acts chapter 1, we find that Jesus is replicating with his disciples. He says, you'll be my witnesses first in Judea. That's where we started. Jerusalem, excuse me. Then in Judea. Then in Samaria. Then the ends of the world. In other words, when Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit was going to take them on the new journey, it wasn't very new. He had already taken them on this journey. But here's the thing. Our faith remains small when we are out of sync with God's journey. And God's plan. God rarely have I seen anywhere in scripture where God says, okay, I brought you to this place. Now you can chill. No. There's always one more destination. One more destination. One more person. One more village. One more city. One more people group. 
But sometimes our faith remains where it is because our life is out of sync with God's life. I'll tell you a short story as I close. Famous pastoral lies as I close, right? Uh, when we first moved here to Scotland, navigating around Fife was quite easy. Uh, but navigating in, in, in the city of Edinburgh, which isn't very large, 500,000 people, but it's an old city where the roads will end, and it's called something terrace because there's a lot of terraces in Scotland, something terrace, and another road cuts off. And I was driving, and I, the GPS was telling me, or excuse me, somebody's address told me to go to something terrace. And I went there, and I didn't see the rest of the road. It was a T-junction. And I didn't understand what was going on. So I called the person and says, oh, yes, the navigation says to do this. But you actually need to go south down this road, go around this block, and go around to the other side, and you'll see the terrace. In other words, terrace was cut off. But my GPS said to go straight through. Who am I going to trust? The person who lives on that destination? Or Google that tells me where to go. Almighty Google, right? So I was following my GPS. Told to me I was completely lost. And I called the lady from our church or the fan from our church and said, hey, I have no idea where I am. They're like, oh, you're probably at this point. I said, yes, that's exactly where I am. Are you watching me? <laughs> I said, no, no, go south and then go east and then go north and then start again west and you'll be where you need to be. Church family, uh, this world is constantly trying to reroute us and put us out of sync with God's will. I wouldn't say the people of this world, say the world and the sin that's within it, the agencies that live within it, constantly trying to derail your journey with God. What we must do is to listen to the one who is the ultimate navigator. He is the one whom we should make sure that we are completely in sync with. The catastrophe and the end of this story doesn't end well. The people tried to go and fight against the Canaanites, which was never God's plan. They were defeated because God's will, God's hand was not with them. The book of Numbers chapter 14 says they went to fight against Canaan and anyways, ignored God. Raised arms when it was never God's will. And sometimes we wonder, why aren't things working out? I'm serving God. I'm doing what, why aren't things working? Because maybe the way you're doing it isn't the way God wants you to do it in the first place. And then came the 40 years of traversing the wilderness unnecessarily because their faith was out of sync with God's. You know, um, I still believe, and I, and I do echo the words of uh, Ted Wilson, who's the new president for the General Conference, he said this on his Friday afternoon, it was our afternoon, I think it was morning, devotional message. He said this statement. He says, I still believe that Jesus is coming back. In the crowd, there was one sound came through the microphone. Somebody in the crowd was probably fit. Did you, were you over there, St. Louis, on Thursday? <laughs> one person said, Amen. Church family, I still believe Jesus Christ is coming again. I believe that. So I must say, Lord, how's my faith? How's my walk with you? Am I complaining? Am I grumbling? Am I inactive? Am I surrounded by the voice of the masses? Am I afraid by what lies ahead? Do I trust that you're going to provide? Or will I trust you? In stepping forward in faith. It's only you that can bring this to the Lord. It can't be your mom or your dad. It can be your husband, your wife. It must be you that says, Lord, here's my faith. Are you satisfied with my walk with you? If it isn't, say, Lord, what are you wanting me to do? What's the first step? The Lord, I believe, without a question in my mind, He wants to grow our trust, our obedience, our relationship with Him. So when we go home today, at some point today, maybe talk to the Lord one-on-one -on -one and say, Lord, how's my faith? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Because as we see your Holy Spirit moving upon the church and upon the world, still shows that you have not given up on us. On us. You still have faith in us. 
You haven't withdrawn your spirit from this place, giving us the hope that there's still hope for us. Father, we come from different places, but we're gathered under one roof right now. And we ask that you may grow our faith, that you may strengthen our faith. They may teach us to be obedient and to trust that we may reckon that the voice of the masses aren't as important as the voice of our Savior. Lord, forgive us for where and if we've passed on our faith to our children and it's the incorrect practice of faith. Forgive us where we have grumbled and complained. Forgive us, Lord, when we have compared ourselves to others. Forgive us, Lord, when we see the mountains that are ahead of us, the struggles that are before us, the giants that are before us, and thought to ourselves they're too big for God. Forgive us, Lord. And just like the, the man whose son was possessed by a demon, we say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. May this be the answer to prayer for each one of us this morning. We ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Because I hadn't been here in a while, so you got a bonus. Amen. <clears throat> our closing hymn today is hymn number 304, Faith of Our Fathers, Living Still. Okay. Should we stand? Father in heaven, we come before you as we close with a petition to bring us closer to our Savior Jesus, that our days may be filled in his company, that his plans may be our dreams. May our children 
and the next generation see the faith of those that are here. That it was prompted, that it was grown, that it was sustained, not by the pastor, the elder, the teachers, not by the members, but through that walk with Jesus. May our children see us. And where we have perhaps stepped poorly and set a bad example for those around us, including our children, we ask that you may give us a new opportunity to set the path straight. That this church, that those here, may be people who truly are known by the love, the relationship, and the faith that they have in you. We pray these things to your honor and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Join us. Feel free to say hello to one another. We have fellowship lunch today, I believe. So uh, we'll set up some tables and some chairs on this side. If you are here visiting, please stay around if you want to join for some food. Uh, for everybody else, let's give 10 hugs and then we can go. Or handshakes or elbows. Hugs or handshakes or elbows, yeah. Or both. Happy Sabbath, guys.